Hello, congregation, family and friends. I pray all is well with you today. The title of my message today is We Are at War, and we are at war. I'm not talking about the physical wars that are going on around the world. I'm talking about a spiritual war, a spiritual battle. You know, we live in a world that is full of conflict. It hasn't always been that way. It wasn't that way at the very beginning. And it's not always going to remain that way. But for right now, it is. When God created everything in Genesis chapter 1, each, each day he completed his creation for that day. He kept saying it was good. It was good. It was good. When he got to the end of his creation, we read in Genesis 1 verse 31, he pronounced it very good. Nothing was amiss. There was a harmony to everything that God put together. There was a perfection to God's creation. And we read about that in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Nothing was tainted. Nothing was amiss. Nothing was wrong. And the key thought here is that there was harmony within all creation. God and man were in harmony with each other. Man and woman were in harmony with each other. Mankind was in harmony with the animal kingdom around him. Nothing was wrong until sin entered into the world. That's the way that it was. And that peace and that harmony ended at the end of Genesis 2. In Genesis 3, something happened. Sin entered into the world and it resulted in disharmony. All of a sudden, God and man were no longer in harmony. Man and woman were not in harmony anymore. The animals and man, they were not in harmony anymore. Sin had destroyed everything that God had created and tainted everything. Mankind was no longer getting along with God's creation. Everything was haywire. Everything was screwy. Now, through the curses that God instituted in Genesis 3, it was ensured... And listen, it was ensured that the world would never find harmony again on its own. Harmony could only be found through divine intervention. That's what I'm leading up to today. We recognize, we know that we, we live in a world that needs saving. There's a lot of people that need saving, but only God can provide a savior. We cannot do it on our own, of course. And... What we're getting to here in Genesis 3, and this is a this is very deep, so let me say this up front to you. Let me encourage you to read all of Genesis 3 for yourself and study through the various curses because Genesis 3 is one of the most important chapters in all of Scripture. After we get through the, the creation in Genesis 1 and 2, when sin enters into the world in Genesis 3, everything gets turned upside down. All of a sudden, there, there is no harmony anymore. There's disharmony. All of a sudden, sin starts permeating every facet of our life, and it continues to this very day. But we are at war against those forces of evil. We are at war, if we are true believers, we are at war against Satan and his kingdom. So I don't have time in this sermon, because this would be a series of sermons, but for this particular sermon, I want to focus on Genesis 3.15, which everybody knows and I don't know how you've been taught this, and maybe you'll learn something today, and maybe you won't. But Genesis 3.15 is sometimes called the first preaching of the gospel. It's the first indication in Scripture here of messianic hope. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I hope to show that to you today. This verse is seen, and it's understood as a promise that Messiah would be coming. And although Jesus is not mentioned specifically here, you do not see the word Jesus here, he is there. We do know through other biblical references, many of them, hundreds of prophecies throughout the Old Testament that Jesus was coming. This is really the first mention that he was on his way or he would be on his way. He was coming as a warrior. He was coming as a Messiah. He was coming as a Savior who would achieve victory over the evil of the world. Remember, we can't do anything about the evil. We fell into evil. We fell into sin. And the only way we can get out of it is for our Messiah, Jesus alone. Only he can end the hostility that's in the world. And it is hostility. You know it. I know it. It's all around us every day. You know, in our average life, we meet people who are Christians, right? We meet people who we can fellowship with. We can talk to about Jesus and the Bible. We can pray together. We may even worship together at church. There are people that we have a kinship with. We're part of the body of Christ. But then there's other people 
that reject Jesus. They've rejected the Bible. They hate us for being Christians. They mock us. They persecute us. That, that is, that's the hostility. That is the conflict that we're talking about. You've experienced it, and so have I. Every day of our lives, if we're living in this present world, until all is changed and there's a new heaven and a new earth, we are fighting conflict. We are at war. We are at war. And we need to take it seriously. We cannot afford to lose the war. So when we think about it in this war, there's two, there's two opposing kingdoms in this world. We have the kingdom of God and we have the kingdom of Satan. All of us belong to one kingdom or the other. We, we, there's no, there's nobody in the middle. Okay. All of us are going to spend eternity in one place, either in heaven forevermore with the Lord Jesus or in eternal hell with Satan and all those people who have rejected Christ. So nobody gets to stay in the middle. No one gets to sit on the fence. Everyone has to choose a side. What side are you on today? Who's your warrior? Is Jesus your warrior or is Satan your warrior? Who are you following today? That's what I hope to show you in this verse. Now, let me also say this to you, too, that the kingdom of heaven uh, and the kingdom of believers has nothing to do with race, financial status, has nothing to do with your age, your location, what you do for a living, your family history, has nothing to do with that. God has people in all races and all cultures all around the world. We don't know who all of God's people are, but we know that Christ is out there and Christ has saved the people God has saved the people for himself. And that is still going on today. And that's something we have to remember. After mankind fell at the beginning of Genesis 3, God brought his curses upon the creation. And you can see that anywhere from Genesis 3 verses 14 down through 18, maybe 19. Now, even as that was occurring, God already had a plan for those people who were going to be saved, those people that were going to enter into this kingdom of God. God's will was to send a Messiah. So having said all of that, let us consider our text here. In Genesis 3, 15, it says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the second verse of of a curse that God pronounced upon Satan. Now, before I get into this any further, if you want to break this down, there were three curses that God brought out that day. The first curse was to Satan, and that was in verses 14 and 15. The second curse was to the woman in verse 16. And the third curse was to the man in 17, 18, and 19. Three separate curses. So we have to understand that, first of all, in context, who he is talking to. So in Genesis 3.15, which, as I said earlier, is, is commonly understood as a messianic verse, as a verse of prophecy that Christ was coming, he is addressing Satan. We need to make that clear. He's addressing to Satan. Now, this verse, when I look at this, raises to me a very important and interesting question. Why do we need a Messiah? Why do we need a savior to end the hostility that's in the world? And just as a quick aside, if you're not sure what the word enmity means, it means hostility. It means, um, it means in direct opposition. It means opposite sides. If you're on a battlefield and you're standing for Jesus over here and there's other people standing for Satan over here, okay, that you are at enmity with your enemies. There's nobody in the middle ground. You have two armies ready to face one another and that's what we're ha that's what's happening we have two kingdoms in this world that are clashing with one another that's what's happening so the question is why do we need a messiah to take care of all this and as i said before the hostility i'm referring to is a spiritual battle it's spiritual hostility as opposed to a physical war and i think there are three things that god would want us to see in this verse, there's three things that I see, and I'll do my best to explain them to you, because as I said, it, this gets deep. And again, I will encourage you, read this passage for yourself and study it. First of all, the first thing we see to answer the question, why do we need a Messiah? The first thing I see is the hostility between Satan and mankind is ordained by God himself. Did you see that? Look at the first phrase, and I will put enmity 
Who's talking? It's God. I will put enmity. God is responsible for this. With these words, God is establishing that the future of the human race will be marked and characterized by an ongoing hostility. God's design is to remove mankind's friendship with Satan and bring it back to God. Now, in providing salvation through the Messiah, Jesus, God is going to restore mankind to fellowship with him. Eventually, when this world is destroyed, we know that when God creates the new heaven and the new earth, all of the evil and all of the sin will be gone. And we, the true believers, those who have accepted Christ and those who are in Christ, will live in a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. That is where the hostility is going to end. But up until that day, up until Jesus comes back, up until Judgment Day, we are going to be living with this ongoing hostility, this ongoing war. It's going to happen. Now, I submit this to you. This may be, I'm not sure if you'll get this, but I submit to you that if God had not put enmity into a fallen world, there would have been no salvation plan. There would have been no chance for mankind to be in fellowship again with God, as we saw in Genesis 1 and 2. Had God not intervened, Mankind would have stayed in sin. None of us would be going to heaven. None of us would be saved if God had not done this. So the first point I think we have to see is that God ordained this enmity. He put it in there. He said, I will bring enmity. The second point I want us to see is that the hostility between Satan and mankind is ongoing right to the present day. Look at the next phrases. God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So we need to consider that, those phrases here. What is he talking about between thee and the woman? Now remember, he's talking to Satan. Thee means you, Satan. And the woman, he's talking about Eve. Essentially what he's saying here is because he's going to put enmity between the and the woman, doesn't say women, doesn't say women forevermore, it says the woman. And I know we could look at that and saying, well, the woman means all of womanhood, the woman, as opposed to the man. But in this case, it's a specific person. By saying this, you see, Eve, how do I want to say this, is no longer in league with the devil. If you remember earlier in Genesis 3, when God said to the woman, what have you done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. She was in fellowship with Satan. She fell for his lies and she was under his influence or his leadership. She obeyed what he said to do. He put doubt in her mind and she went and sinned against God. So the first thing God had to do was tell Satan is, I'm separating you from this woman that you just deceived. That's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm separating you both. I'm going to put enmity between you. And you'll notice, and I think that fits in with a little later in verse 16, and I won't go into detail here, but in verse 16 when he says to the woman, Thy desire shall be for the husband, and he shall rule over thee. Satan is not going to be ruling over her. She's going to have a desire for her husband not to fall into the clutches of Satan. But we now have the next phrase that says, between thy seed and her seed. Now, that's a whole different matter now, because not, now God is establishing hostility between the offspring of Satan, and I will explain that in a moment, and the offspring of the woman. As long as children are being born, as long as some people are being saved and other people reject the gospel and they don't get saved, we will always have this ongoing offspring. Some are saved, some are not saved. Hence the hostility, hence the war that we are in. How many Christians do you know that, you know, follow scripture and they, they have accepted Christ? And then there's other people that say, you know what, the Bible's not for me, and I don't believe it. It's a fictional book. It's hocus pocus. I, I, it does. I, I, they, I, they reject the gospel. That is the ultimate war. That is what's happening here. And so that is what God is talking about when He says to Satan, "I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between you and Eve, and between your seed, thy seed, and her seed." Now, there's something else that we have to understand here. God also has a separate 
inferencing here when he says her seed. Jesus came through a woman. Yes, it was a virgin birth, but he came through a woman, through his mother Mary. And so God is setting this up messianically. He's showing us messianically that one day Messiah is coming. One day the Savior is coming and there will be a division between your seed and her seed. So while we see it on a human standpoint, we also need to see it from a divine intervention. And I think we'll see that even more clearly in the next phrase when we're talking about bruising. Now, the two phrases that we're looking at at the moment lay the foundation for understanding that there is a division in the human race. We can see that. But what did Jesus have to say about those who follow Satan? I made a notation here. John 8, 44, he said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. It's harsh words, but it's full of truth. Jesus can only be talking about Satan, the same liar who lied to Eve and whose lie began the fall of mankind. He's the same liar that's lying to people today. The Bible calls him the, the prince of the power of the air, we read in Ephesians. He blinds the eyes of people to the truth. Can, can we start to see, can you see how huge this problem is, how big the schism is? Remember, we're over here in the kingdom of heaven. And we're over there in the kingdom of God. Okay? There's nothing in the middle. You have to decide. We're at war. What side are you on? What side are you going with? Are you on God's side? Or are you on Satan's side? Because we're in a war. We are in a war. And it's, we fight it daily. We fight it hourly. We fight it every minute. Because Satan is relentless. So you really do have to think about and ask yourself, where do I stand? Where do I stand on all of this? You know, we read of another messianic prophecy, a very familiar one, in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Call his name Emmanuel. We can trace that royal line that God has chosen. We can begin it with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then moving down to uh, Judah, David, Solomon, Ultimately, Christ is born into this line, and he was the seed. And then the seed extends to all those who become the, the body of Christ. We are in Christ. We are the seed. We become the seed. Those of us who are in the seed of the woman are fully aware, and we are fully aware of the war that we're in. We're in, we're in battle every day. When's the last time you were insulted? Or, or rejected or cursed at or simply shunned because you're a Christian. When's the last time you, you, you tried to speak to someone about Christ and they just turned their back on you? There are people that won't like what I'm saying. I'm bringing the word of God to you. That's between you and God. We're all in this same war together. Now, Jesus is the Messiah that he's talking about here. Now, in our final phrase, the, the third point that I want to bring up is the hostility between Satan and mankind is brought to a climax only in the Messiah, only in Jesus. The last phrase we see here is, it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Now, there are some translations and most of them take out the word it and put he. Because he's talking about Christ. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. What is God talking about? The seed of the woman, who are the true believers, and the seed of the serpent, the unbelievers, are centered in two individuals, right? We have Jesus versus Satan. Now, even though in Genesis 3.15, Jesus, as I said before, as I said before, he's not mentioned here by name, we know that he's there. Jesus foretold the defeat of Satan that would take place at the cross. Here's what he said in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. 
Even before Jesus went to the cross, he prophesied that judgment was already here and that Satan would be cast out and defeated. He was doomed. But we have to ask this question. Does this mean that Satan no longer has power in the world? No, that's not what it means. Does it mean that Satan is still taking people to hell every single day? Yes. There are still people falling for his lies. There are still people, even as we speak, Lord have mercy on them, even as we speak, there are people who are dying and going to hell as we speak. It should break our hearts. We're at war. We are at war. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when he went to the cross. In John 19, 30, Jesus said three words. It is finished. And what he meant at that moment when he said it is finished was Satan was defeated. He could no longer win. He could no longer have influence over everybody. Jesus had paid the full price for humanity's fall for those who would come to trust in him. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid it all, the, the, the psalmist said. All to him I owe. So now that we're looking at this, we need to kind of reflect a little bit on this verse. I can't stress to you enough for you to study each one of these curses, putting them in context, but also seeing them as a whole, because all of the curses came at the same time. And while they were three separate curses, it all resulted from man's fall into sin. So when we reflect on this verse, we need to think about this. If you accept that God has ordained the hostility to exist between those who follow Jesus and those who follow Satan. I have to ask you again, whose side are you on? Because we're at war. You can't be in the middle. You can't just sit in the middle and make no decision. You have to be on one side or the other. We're at war. War means you, mean you got to take sides. What side are you on? The second thing is there's only two types of people in the world. There's those who believe and there's those who don't believe. Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure that you belong to the body of Christ? Are you sure you're on the right side of the war? What side are you on? Because we're at war. Do you believe that there's only one person, one person, Jesus Christ, who can win the battle against evil? Do you believe that? Do you believe there's more than one way to heaven? Do you believe there's more than one God? Do you believe anything other than what scripture teaches? You better check yourself. Because we're at war. And any of us in this war can die at any moment. And we better be ready when, when we need, when our time is up, when we're moving into eternity, we better be ready. And we better make sure that we pick the right side. I'm, I, I just praise God today that in this verse we can see so much. That we see so much just in one verse. Let me just say one last thing. When you talk about bruising thy head and bruising his heel, you all know what that means. Where is a snake's power, a serpent's power? It's all in his head. His head are where the fangs are. His head is where the poison is. His head is what attacks you and bites onto you. And if you don't have the antidote, you will die. A snake bite, most of the snakes are are poisonous. In Satan's case, he is poison. He's evil. And if he bites on you and you don't have the antidote, you will die. You will die. If a snake bites you, you don't have the antidote, you will die. Are you hearing me? But here's the thing. If his head is crushed, a snake cannot hurt you. If you crush a serpent's head, you've taken away all of his defense. You've taken away all of his offense. You've taken away what makes his brain would be crushed. His fangs are crushed. The poison can't enter you. He's dead. He can't hurt you. And so when the Bible says it or he shall bruise his head, bruise means he's going to stomp on you, Satan. He's going to take care of you. He's going to kill you. You're going to be defeated. And then Satan, when he crushes you, when he defeats you, the only thing you can do is bruise his heel. Now think about it. The heel or the foot is the furthest part of your body from your vital organs. And if you were bit in the foot or in the heel, 
you have time to get the antidote and still be saved and be rid of that poison as opposed to if you were bit right in the heart or you were bit maybe in another area where it would go directly to your organs. So here we see that Jesus is going to crush Satan right where he lives, right on his head. And all Satan is going to do is kind of nip at his heel because Satan has been defeated. That's what God is talking about here. So if Satan has been crushed, and you believe that, and you can see that in this verse, and you're part of the kingdom of God, if you're a true believer today, then I praise God that you are part of the kingdom. You're on the right side of the war. Before I close, let me just read this one last time. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan is defeated, my friends. He is defeated. But you have to decide in this ongoing war, in this daily, hourly, minute-by-minute -minute war, what side are you on? Are you on Jesus' side in the kingdom of God? Or are you still on Satan's side? Because I got news for you. Satan's going to lose. He's going to lose. And anybody who's on this side has a fiery ending waiting for them for eternity. We're at war. You've got to realize we're at war. What are you doing in your part of the war? I pray that this message has brought, maybe you learned something, maybe you didn't. I hope that it um, ministered to you in some way. If it has, please feel free to share this. This video, any video, anything I put up, this has, no, this has helped you. If this has ministered to you, if you know someone who needs to hear this message, please feel free to share it or anything that I post. I want to thank you for being here for this message. God bless you.